moving effort as a reaction to a failure of Dallas land use, zoning, and related policies. My name is Alan McGill. I'm the moderator of this panel. We are joined by Brittany Hyde and Commissioner Richardson. My goodness, thank you, Daryl, and Daryl Baker. More about them in just a moment. You have heard throughout the day instances of failures of the Dallas uh, political establishment, the corporate establishment, and reacting in some way to protect residents and neighborhoods. What you will hear from these three distinguished panelists is how they chose to deal with this, not as individual organizations, but organizations that saw a common need, a common issue. And they did something not just these three organizations, uh, but others throughout the city. It's something that's often very difficult to do. Come together around common issues that affected a large number of organizations and neighborhoods, mainly located in southern Dallas the area that we commonly describe as south of I-30. I happen to live one block from UNT Dallas. I live just a few blocks from Lane Plain Superfund site. I live just a few blocks from the Dallas landfill Now, on the one hand, we have a university, the first in the city of, of Dallas, which we are extremely proud of. But our next door neighbors are basically killing us. So this town will talk about how they came together to effectively change city policy or influence city policy, both current and future. I'd like to just um, give you an idea of the background and, and, and any oversight or misrepresenting these panelists' background is my fault. Um, Mr. Baker, I'm going to pick on you first. Uh, Darrell Baker is a member of the Housing Policy Task Force in the city of Dallas and a founding member of Fair Share for All Dallas. Mr. Baker is a living example of a peace co-worker. He was assigned to Morocco, and I suppose spent a good deal of time there. He also earned an MBA and a Master's of Architecture. He worked for the city of Dallas as a city and park planner. His interests are Right in some ways in foreign countries. You can ask him about that later. Um, Kamisha Richardson is, and uh, she wanted to list this first. She is a neighborhood and community volunteer and activist uh, for 
Elm Thicket North Park neighborhood. And if you are not familiar with that, I will ask Misha to spend a, a minute or two talking about what kind of neighborhood that is and what it represents to Dallas today. She is a SMU graduate, a certified public accountant, a cloud software engineer, and certified architectural architect. She is committed to the support and advancement of neighborhoods of color, activity, reinvestment, and other community actions. She is a steering committee member of the Coalition for Neighborhood Self-Determination. And the last panelist is Brittany Hyde. She is the founder and strategic director of the social impact firm Ethos Equity Consulting. Brittany uh, chose a very, or a very difficult topic, a very difficult career path. Anytime that you choose as part of your career path, and it includes the word equity, life is likely to be different for you. Equity is a buzzword now, but for some of us, we've never seen equity. But we have a panelist who will be able to talk about how she's been able to offer advice to uh, both profit and nonprofit organizations and how she has tried to get them to understand that equity and equality is not the same and it's a difficult concept for some of us to grasp understand and actually execute Brittany consistently established effective paths to profit to progress by shaping up the status quo and cultivating courageous leaders with empathy, clarity, and an intersectional DEI approach. Prior to launching Ethos Equity, Brittany successfully managed projects uh, ranging from 20 million to 200 million. Those are rather large, large projects with large budgets. Um, Brittany is a graduate of the University of Missouri with degrees in communication and business. And she is certified in leadership, diversity, equity, and inclusion from Northwestern University. Brittany's lived experiences, professional roles, and education are critical components of ethos equity her firm. So without um, spending any more time uh, talking about the illustrious backgrounds, I will um, open the discussion by asking just one or two questions. And I would ask that you in the audience, if you have questions that you would like to ask um, to the panelists, if you will wait until they make their initial remarks. Each will take five or six or seven minutes or so to help you understand something about um, their organizations, something about the issues that they were wrestling with, and how that led to forming or becoming a part of a coalition to deal with land use 
zoning and related policy issues in Dallas. Uh, the first question that I would like to ask uh, the panelists is, what is the mission of your organization and how did you get involved in the Coalition for Neighborhood Self-Determination? And we'll start with Samisha. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McGill. Okay, um, I am a resident of Elm Thicket North Park. Um, and for those of you who don't know, it is one of the last historically black communities north of the Trinity, in addition to Arlington Park and Hamilton Park. Um, in 2016, um, Mayor Pro Tem Adam Madrano selected our neighborhood to be part of the Neighborhood Plus program, uh, with the goals being neighborhood stabilization and revitalization. And as part of that process, in 2017, we formed our neighborhood association. And the goals of that neighborhood association was to create, or is to create, fair and affordable housing, which I know we've heard a lot about today, um, to retain or even increase home ownership for minorities in the community, um, to protect our neighborhood legacy and heritage, as well as to enhance some of the rental options that were available in that part of, or basically north of I-30. Uh, um, and what we were saying, or kind of the reason why we kind of created this whole program, became a part of the neighborhood, us program and created the neighborhood association is because in the early 2000s is when we started seeing builders come into the neighborhood and basically tearing down some of the small traditional cottages and replacing those like with the big big mansions and so of course those were causing a lot of different issues there was you know um, foundation issues with the neighboring properties there's um, we were having safety issues because a lot of the newer homes were being built with a different setback. And basically, the builders were coming in and just running rough shop through the neighborhood. And a lot of that was primarily due to zoning disparity that was in the neighborhood. So as part of the neighborhood association, we were trying to make that zoning uniform throughout the neighborhood because we wanted to determine what our neighborhood looked like and what we wanted in our neighborhood. Um, so we started the kind of like the zoning process. We started that process to make the zoning uniform in 2017. And unfortunately, I'm here to say that it's now 2022 and that process is still ongoing. So we were a part of this whole current process that we have to go through now for the rezoning, but for COVID and then a, a lot of other different reasons, bureaucracy and all the other red tape that we're having to go through, we're still in the process of trying to get our area rezoned. Um, so as part of those goals and the fact that we are still going through this process as it is now, we became aware of the coalition and we wanted to join in with the coalition and align ourselves with them primarily in the areas of self-determination and for affordable and fair housing in our area because we know that you know there's a lot of discussion around it in the south or south of the trinity but there are a lot of people who aren't aware that you know we have that there are black communities north of the trinity and the type of issues that we're facing in the sense that we're kind of being pushed south of the Trinity or just basically out of that area. So that's kind of how our neighborhood kind of came to be in alignment in with the coalition and kind of joining our efforts. In addition, there's just, you know, there's strength in numbers and a better chance of getting your voice heard throughout the community, with the city, and, you know, getting that message out to the other communities. Um, right. Brittany? Okay, thank you. Um, as Mr. McGill introduced to me, my name is Brittany Height, and I'm the strategic director and founder of Ecos Equity Consulting. And our mission is to really shake up the status quo. Um, we help individuals, institutions, 
initiatives really dismantle racial and social oppression. Um, thinking of everything that happened, everything that we went through in 2020 with not only a health pandemic, but a racial one, it was really important for me to be able to align and partner with, um, like I said, individuals, organizations to authentically um, make transformative changes. And we do that by first starting with an anti-racist diversity, equity, and inclusion approach. And that begins by first educating about the historic context of our country and the systems that are created. Then we amplify lived experiences and round it out with strategic recommendations for uh, sustainable change. And I got involved with the coalition after learning that the city was removing the pathway for um, neighborhoods and organizational leaders to create policies that are, or to create plans that are ultimately implemented into policy. Because I live in East Dallas and I saw the, the um, two point Rockwood, White Rock East plan happen under that same framework, as well as the Cost Melinda area plan. But then when residents in West and South Dallas, who are primarily black and brown, are leveraging that same opportunity, it's not no longer available. So for me, that raised a red flag in terms of racial equity, and I knew I had to get involved. Great to meet you, Cheryl. Um, I come from Cajun country on the texas Louisiana border in the Gulf Coast, so things like Rattlesnake, alligators, and hurricanes are no stranger to me. There's a saying that says that the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And my experience with the coalition came from the fact that having worked for the city of Dallas for 26 years and only ever having lived only in Oak Cliff that whole time, even till today, I discovered that there were a lot of inequities. And the way that you're brought up, was saying it's like, well, you know, I bet you, well, I know that your bulldog could beat my skunk in a fight any day of the week, but I also know he won't do it twice. Becoming that skunk, uh, learning things like, uh, with the city of Dallas, uh, when I was project manager for building the Katy Trail, and there was a tremendous amount of neighborhood engagement there with all kinds of people. Uh, this discovery that the common enemy we had in getting the Cape Trail built was the city itself. And I came up with the expression in public groups like this by saying the city is a bad boyfriend. And strangely enough, nobody asked me, well, what does that mean? <laughs> everybody, everybody got that. Um, so getting back to the city being the problem in most cases, why would you listen to someone? Why would you trust the solution to a problem to the people, to the very people who created the problem? Thankfully, in talking with some of the founders of the coalition, we had this discussion. And one of the things they were reluctant to do that, we, that led to our success with Fair Share for All Analysis that we do call names. So Pierre Chaco, who was the director of Urban Design, uh, told this group no. And by calling people's real names, by identifying the actual problem, the coalition decided, well, he has to go. And when I see on the cake, two other critical people who were blocks to community or neighborhood led planning decided that they should retire or seek employment somewhere else. That's the first thing you have to do. Uh, you don't negotiate with bad people. You don't negotiate with people who don't negotiate with good faith. But it, it's insane to do that. Our experience in District 3, where I live, is that we really need rich people. We have tons and tons of affordable housing. We don't need any more. We really need rich people and grown-ups who pay taxes, pay the bills, and who understand that fixing potholes and having police protection in a timely fashion is more important than rebuilding a million square foot convention center that the excuse is they need to rebuild it because it's been neglected. 
why would you do that? But they find money to do that, but not money to fix our potholes and other things, which is completely insane. And so we have to step up and change the framework of the conversation. And zoning was a specialty that I had. And when we had developers coming in wanting to build warehouses next to Capella Park, which is a high-end, in-town residential development, initially owned by the Potter's House, and the excuse was, well, we don't want to build a warehouse in a warehouse district because the land over there is too expensive. Well, tough. That's where <laughs> grown-ups do what grown-ups are supposed to do. We discovered that the city does a very bad job of running the city. When, when we did a census of the city, you have 80% of the highest paid workers for the city, directors, assistant directors, supervisors, special, specialists, who do not live in the city. Pure Chop will be one of them. Yet he tells you you cannot have access to the neighborhood-led planning process. Thankfully, uh, they took on the skunk position and said, well, we'll take that particular insult, so we'll put somebody in your seat who will say yes. And so he's gone. They've got that process going, and that's a very, very good thing. In our zoning battles, we discovered that the zoning planners who don't live in the city, who are very, very, very new to the department, who, especially during COVID, didn't bother to leave their desk and go out to look at the neighborhoods surrounding these request sites. And we said, well, why would we think that your recommendation was a good recommendation? Um, so two warehouses with uh, Trammell Crow and Moss Crow Jr., those projects bit the dust because we made our case. Four latte projects bit the dust, and those average about $60 million apiece. So we're sitting on top of $460 million that we kept out of the broken policy of developers uh, because we said no. We put tremendous pressure on our council member, and we wouldn't back down. But the city decided, well, let's be sneaky about this, and we'll just start trying to put in projects without telling anybody. Well, the good news for us is that that's against the law. So, we, but what we said, that's against the law, you can't do that. Um, the latest one that just got passed by a newly created public finance corporation is the Mountain Creek Apartments, where Public Works brought forth an apartment complex project. Go figure that. Well, uh, it got approved, but um, long story short, we built up enough evidence between enemies of our common enemy, who became our allies. And so we have filed a formal complaint with HUD against the city of Dallas and the Housing Finance Corporation for their unfair housing practices. And we've got boxes and boxes of proof that for the last 40 years, and especially for the last, I guess since 2018, the last 40 years, when they pass their own housing policy, comprehensive housing policy, that they're even violating that. So, uh, again, uh, the bulldog understands that he doesn't want to mess with this skunk or that skunk, and hopefully this skunk will get them into the picture and we can really get some stuff done here. Uh, that's how I become memorable, but again, you have to be organized, you have to be dedicated to this. And you have to not you have to stand up to the bullies who keep bullying me. And there's been a lot of inspiration I've gotten from people like you all, groups like the ones that are forming, and other neighborhood leaders who say enough. And our unified voices can really make a difference. The second um, set of questions on a question that I would like for each of the panelists to respond to. The coalition platform has three main pillars. Environmental justice, fair and affordable housing, and self-determination. How successful is the city of Dallas 
in promoting those three items. And before the panelists um, respond, I would like, after they make this response, I would like to put a pin in the other two questions that I have for them and ask if there are any questions from the audience. Sometimes I know that it's difficult to remember stuff when we go a long time. So, but, and there is always a but. Uh, we, would, we would like for the, sh the questions to be short and to the point so that we can finish the presentation. Um, uh, with that, um, start with me. <laughs> uh, is the city of Dallas doing a good job? No, it is not. <laughs> <laughs> Let me uh, just re repeat the question. How successfully is the city of Dallas in promoting those three um, pillows that made up and caused this coalition to come into being? So far. Okay, I'll say a little bit more than that. Um, when I think of the three issues, I think I, I use an equity lens for them, obviously. So um, I think about how there are still zip codes within our city who the residents living there are predetermined to be exposed to toxic pollutants or um, you know piles of trash because of the way that it's known. I think about um, in terms of homelessness, I think about how many unhoused individuals are in our city and how that number keeps rising and has been since 2011. Um, then in terms of self-determination, like I said earlier, when thinking about uh, the fact that East Dallas was able to use these neighborhood-led plans and have them drafted into policy and then when East or excuse me, and then when West and South, Southern Dallas decided to do the same, all of a sudden the, the rules for the game changed. So for me, despite even thinking about all the national attention that Dallas got when Miss Marsha Jackson and Shingle Mountain um, was publicly televised on the national station and the national publication, and there's still she and Floral Farms and so many other neighborhoods, West Dallas, are dealing with um, the same issue, um, that gives me pause. Thinking about the fact that areas that were once considered undesirable, like West Dallas, for example, um, where or other places where black and brown people were kind of forced into creating their communities, that those areas and neighborhoods are now being poached by developers, that's very problematic. And then um, just it's all kind of unfortunate, and I share all of that because I really think that the city has a responsibility to take an intersectional approach with these um, issues because they're not isolated and really work cross-departmentally in order to mitigate the harm that's continually being caused. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. <laughs> so I would have to say no, but I'm hopeful that that can change. Um, our neighborhood has not had issues like with environmental injustice issues, so we haven't had any like industrial land use issues. However, in the terms of like say fair and affordable housing, um, the problem that we have with our neighborhood is that basically our people are being priced out and pushed out, right? So. When that happens, the, de the builders and the developers come to us and say, well, we're giving you good money, but where are you gonna go? Because one, this is a flourishing economy right now, so prices are not decreasing, so whatever wealth that you have in your home, as soon as you sell it, it's gone. So say you get $500,000 for your home, as soon as you put it in the bank, it's no longer worth 500,000, it's actually less than that. So they're, they use that, or they have been telling our residents that in terms of saying, okay, we're gonna give you all this money, but the thing is, there's no place else for them to go. So they only end up in places where it may, may not be as desirable. 
being in a place, getting pushed to a place where they are adjacent to, you know, industries and things like that. So there are no really affordable places to go. So even if they have this equity that they build up all, over all this time and they sell it, there's still no place for them to go. There's there's no affordable housing any place. So if, in terms of that, no. <laughs> but and I don't see that changing. Um, in terms of self determination, I'm hoping that will change with the zoning process that we're going through now. We are with the current process, which I know will be changing. We went through the authorized hearing process. As part of that authorized hearing process, you get a steering committee, an authorized steering committee form. Well, guess what? All that's driven by your council member. So if you don't have a good relationship with your council member, you pretty much don't really have a good shot of getting your neighborhood led plan, your zoning, whatever you want for your neighborhood, what are the odds of you actually getting that put into place? Because that steering committee, which I believe is 13 members, they could, have, they could stack it with nine developers and maybe four residents. There's no requirement to say you have to have that steering committee be residents only or majority residents because they're the ones living in the neighborhood. They know what they want their neighborhood to look like and what, how they want their land to be used. So if it gets that with developers and builders, so guess what, that's what's going to happen in that area. And somehow whatever zoning or neighborhood plan you develop somehow gets changed because during that process, you come up with your recommendations before it goes to CPC and then eventually city council so i'm hope i say i'm hopeful because i know in the process the city or pd is looking at changing that process so we have to get that out of the hands of the city as far as determining how that neighborhood -led plan is going to get implemented so right now no and when that new process is going to get implemented i don't know but i'm hopeful that it, will, I think, that it will change that direction. And to just kind of piggyback off of what Queen just said, in terms of success, I think it would be really helpful if there were transparent metrics that were associated with each of these projects and if there was a level of accountability um, that was in place in order to make sure things happen and if they don't happen, what happens next? Well, Matt interjected that in a very wonderful way that you all explain things, there's still very much a need when you deal with the city to be strategic and be effective. And I would say, as a proud graduate of the Lorena Bobby Charm School, that that <laughs> method is really necessary when you're dealing again with people who will not be transparent, with people who will not negotiate in good faith. Uh, you have nothing to lose there. And because we've been so silent for so long, because we've been misrepresented in the past by people, our color in our communities who have not held our interest in, as a priority. Uh, as good Southerners say and bad Southerners say, the city just doesn't know any better. And they treat us this way because they've always got the way of treating us this way. And until you become that skunk, until you become that Lorena Bobbitt, they have no real no interest or no real reason to change what's worked for them. So there's a, a large part of our behavior that has to change in order to get the kind of changes we need and to preserve, protect, and like I'm saying, and this is speaking more for Rishan Road, which is another traditional black neighborhood that gets overlooked, because these were the doctors and lawyers and rich black people who were just uh, above Forest Lane, just below LBJ, just off the Preston Road. Um, you don't get mad at the player. You learn how to play the game and play the game to win. There's no reason that your neighborhood should remain an affordable neighborhood of color. Your neighborhood deserves to be a rich neighborhood of color. So again, keeping that in mind, it's not either or. And just like when you're on a cruise ship and the menu has lobster and steak on it, and you're wondering, 
or which one should I choose? Well, you don't have to choose. You can have both. And the only choice you have to make is whether you want it on the same plate or different plates. So again, in this quest, again, in this booming economy, affordability is important. It's absolutely important. In our case, we have too much of it. But uh, you should be sharing in prosperity too and building these life tech projects that are 100% low income eligible, that are 100% program eligible for the tax credit, in areas that are already affordable, that's insane. And there's no reason to do that. And it's also violating the city's own policy for having mixed income developments. So again, something else to think about in this conversation. I know this wasn't necessarily part of like the, the neighborhood led plans, but I just want to add to that because I'm sure it was mentioned earlier, like with the current redistricting mm -hmm. that's happening, right? So as far as being able to come forward now and speak, because now's the time to do it, right? So And your neighborhood is getting split by the that's, that's one of the maps, possibly one of the maps, which is to split our neighborhood into two. And one going to Preston Hollow, and then one staying, which is District 13, and then one staying in District 2. So we would stay there. And then we have another one that would, I think it moves us all to District 14, District 13, or 14, but it's basically historically white in the area. So we would really be the only historically black community within that entire district. So. We are looking at this as an opportunity, not necessarily as a coalition-led effort, but as an opportunity to make our voices heard. Because now is the time, like you say, to be able to step forward and tell the city what we want. So this is the time to do it. The meetings are ongoing. This is definitely not the time just to sit by and see what happens. And it's, like you say, the city has been part of the problem because the committee that was created to come up with these maps during the last meeting, public meeting, one of the members said, we should go into the community, we should have these community meetings and give the neighbors, the residents, the opportunity to voice where they want their neighborhoods to be or you know, at least have some input into the maps. And that committee declined and they came up with it on their own. So how is that community engagement? You have people, and the one who, the commissioner who was in our area, has never even been to our neighborhood. So how are you determining how our neighborhood should look and where that, what district it should reside in and is going to have our best interest in mind? So. What you're hearing uh, clearly is a common thread of uh, running through these conversations. And one is the building block of resident neighborhood based uh, and neighborhood led plans. In other words, we want the city to accept that residents who live in a neighborhood have a right to say how they want their neighborhood to look and evolve. The second element that has been introduced into this discussion is the ongoing redistricting plan. Highly politicized and very difficult to get resident-based input into that process. Practically impossible. So when you when you combine all of these things and even trying to just tell the city, this is how we want our neighborhoods to evolve. This is how, this is our vision for our neighborhood. You would think that that would be a pretty easy sell to a public official, but it's not. Many neighborhoods across I-30 particularly in Southeast Oak Cliff, which has over 90,000 residents, is nothing more than a dumping ground. In the area where I live, Hidden Valley, 
buried in a grocery store within miles. But that's another story. I'd like to open the floor for just a few minutes or for anyone uh, that would like to ask a question to the panelists. Anyone? Yes, ma'am. You may need you may need a mic. I don't know. I, I can talk pretty loud. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, is there a scenario in which the council person for that district doesn't have such a tight grip on the authorized hearing process or um, a rezoning process? I know I, I'm not sure 100 your your background on how everything works in the city. I'm sure everything's very complicated. I'm just trying to just learning myself, but uh, there's just been so much difficulty, especially with cases like Floral Farms, um, trying to do anything that you can to, to take a, one half of a step forward, and it always seems like there's instances where you, you get a win and then you get five losses. So have, do you know of any other examples, maybe in different cities, where we can maybe model something Um, I can say at least with regards because we've done a lot of research and reviewing what the current processes are available or options that are available but as the current process stands no it's all council member driven until that process is changed that's the process you have to follow I will say that um, the coalition is currently working on streamlining a, an outreach and engagement policy to truly amplify the voices of um, residents that aren't being heard or are being ignored. And it's our hope that it can be adopted into policy and then that can, can truly help, you know, reduce some of these gray areas or opportunities where resident voices could be heard and used in, a, in an effective way rather than just leaving it up to a single council person to make that decision. Would that adoption fall under an existing policy or would it be kind of its own thing or fall under like a comprehensive land use? At this point there's there's nothing in place um, so it's our hope that it is adopted holistically across departments and it just becomes a standard. I saw another hand. Yes. Well, I had something to say here. <laughs> Go ahead. Straight to you, though. I, I'm sorry, uh, Darren, where are you going to? Yeah. Uh, to your particular point, the city council has a major deficit and problem with basic math. A good friend of mine uh, sued the city of Dallas for violating its own zoning rules by allowing Methods Hospital to get rid of its uh, pecan grove that was a buffer between East Kessler and Methodist. So she sued the city because the city council suspended their rules. They let a vote come in as a, from a resident who didn't give his wife permission to vote in favor of the neighborhood. And the council decided to just ignore the rules, uh, open it back up and change the vote and the outcome. Well, the city, should not have done that. She sued, the city lost in court. The city appealed as the city does. Uh, and they lost again in court. So something that would have costed them around, let's say $20,000, or something that would cost them $0 had they done the right thing, cost them $20,000 $20, in the first loss in court. And it's now up to $80,000 because of the second trial, or the second ruling by the district court here. So, um, yeah, the council is very challenged when it comes to processes, following its own rules, and doing the right thing. Uh, what you could do is what we did in our, with our council member. We looked at his con campaign contributions. And the reason that my take became such a popular thing for District 3 was that the Apartment Owners Association and the warehouse builders 
make very substantial campaign contributions to his campaign. Uh, again, this is math. This is not magic. And we, we say this every chance we get. So we're not, our group is not particularly popular with our council member, but because he's not particularly po popular with us, we consider that a win. So, uh, and again, practical things, because a process isn't a process if it's not working for everybody. So. I, I will entertain one more question uh, because of the press of time, please. Well, I just wondered whether, um, and I'm assuming the coalition is like a 501c3 and a nonprofit or something, I don't know, but I, that's not as relevant as my next question, which is, have, has the coalition thought about um, endorsing a candidate, find, grooming a candidate that's within your ranks to run and displace the city council members who are roadblocks to these efforts. Just get rid of them. Get someone new. I mean, is that is there a political wing of your coalition that's working on that? Or because it, it seems like you need that partnership. And if you're being stopped at every turn by the people who ostensibly are there to represent your interests, you need someone who actually is representing. I, I just find it just unacceptable that someone is making decisions about your community who has no connection to your community and has never even bothered to visit. So. No, I, I agree 100% with that. But as far as the political aspect of it, um, I can't say the coalition has taken that stance to you know go and publicly endorse specific candidates when it comes time for their, you know, every two years when it comes time for them to, you know, come up for a lunch or whatever. Um, but we do as a neighborhood. So if we see that that council member is not working for us, we do reach out to them. We actually purposely go out and try to establish relationships with our council person. Um, and so for us in our neighborhood, Elm Thick and North Park, I think we do have a decent relationship with our council person, um, but we have seen it in other districts where they don't, like you say, floral farms. So you can see the difference because we also, when we had Adam Madrano as our council person, he was very neighborhood friendly, very community driven, and that helped us to get that neighborhood led, -led process started, and that kind of got us on the road, and you know, so it really does help. So we do reach, we purposely reach out as a neighborhood. We invite them to, when we have neighborhood um, organizations or events, we invite them so we try to establish those relationships. Now, if it doesn't happen, well then, yeah, we let them know. We'll, we'll endorse a different candidate, so. But I think as a neighborhood, it's important for you to reach out and do that. Yeah, and to, to echo what Kamisha said, that's exactly how things happen over in District 9 also. We have good, uh, representation from our council woman and um, she she's been very supportive but I agree there should never be one person right. who drives an entire neighborhood process whether it's zoning or redistricting you should never really have one person to kind of dictate that direction for you yeah. um, well said I think your question needs to be in Mars, the residents have a responsibility to be engaged to the point where it doesn't matter who the council person is, that the voices have to be unified, they have to be what the residents want. Because this battle is ongoing. We've been a victim and a target for so long. No change in law, no change in policy is gonna change the behavior. We teach people how to treat us and I guess in the words of my mother to my daddy, I would never divorce you because I'd never make you that happy. <laughs> so um, we're, we're, not, we're not going anywhere. And we're going to be there even if you're not. And if you're not there, we get the voice. We get to say what needs to be there and what we want. But this is ongoing. This is not going to change. So for residents who are not willing to step up and participate, whether it's if you're not at the table, then you're on the menu.
Thank you. I have just two other questions that I'd like to get to. Uh, the third is the city recently released a new draft policy for neighborhood planning. The coalition has been instrumental in restoring the policy and shaping it moving forward. One of the critical elements that we are pushing is neighborhood ownership and leadership. Why is this important to you? Um, I'll start. I'll start. I'll start. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I think it's extremely important, and it makes me think of um, I'm going to date myself probably here, but that clothing brand, Fubu, and for those of you who don't know, <laughs> it was super cool in the 90s, and it, it, the acronym is For Us, By Us. So ultimately, this brand had to come on the scene in order to fill the gap where there weren't services, or excuse me, not services, clothing for urban culture. So in the same sense, it's really important to have representation at the table because it disrupts the power dynamics. And that's ultimately what needs to happen in order to um, create systemic change if that's ultimately what is going to happen. What she said. Does <laughs> <laughs> any, any other panelists like to speak to that? Um, what I will add to that is that while there is a process in place to replace the current process for like zoning and neighborhood plans, I know the city is in the process of trying to revamp that whole process so it is not le left up to one person um, or one interest, if you will, that's not neighborhood friendly. We do want to make sure that while in the drafting of that policy that we're not just exchanging one city-led process for another city-led process. So it's important that we be a part of that to make sure that this new process that's being developed is becomes more neighborhood-driven and not just, you know, move from a council person to a city department. So that's one thing I'll say about the whole drafting of that policy. I know it's still under works. A lot of things could change in it, so I don't want to say what's out there now is exactly how it's going to be, but I do think it's important that the overall goal of it to be neighborhood driven. Thank you. And uh, the last question that I have is, is the time right? Do you believe that Forward Dallas could be the vehicle for meaningful policy changes to improve quality of life for all residents in Dallas. And for those of you who may not quite recall, all of Dallas is a, a planning process of a, a group, uh, a descriptor of the planning effort the city is undergoing currently uh, to try and create a comprehensive approach to land use uh, planning, including uh, neighborhood-led plans, etc. So, uh, if I can just repeat that, uh, do you believe that Forward Dallas could be the vehicle for meaningful policy change? I'm going to say, sadly, no, because we've gotten off to a very bad start. Um, it's consultant-led, and I live in Southwest Dallas, so that's a whole quadrant of the city. And it's gotten to this point thus far without having included us. And when you can uh, get to this point and not include a whole quadrant of your city, then your, your chances of coming up with an outcome that's legitimate and that's going to be useful are zero. I'll take a little bit more optimism. And I'm going to remain hopeful. I, for me, there needs to be just transparent metrics that are associated with the success. There needs to be involvement from every single community. There needs to be effective and inclusive outreach. Um, ultimately, 
things would have to just kind of flip on their head from what they are right now. And if that happens, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing the outcomes and the results. I would, I would go along those same lines in the sense to say that it could be a good vehicle if the community's involved to their point it hasn't been so far. I mean, there's been public meetings, but I think the key to any of this is you have to let the community know exactly how that's going to impact them. Because a lot of people don't know. So you have to explore all the avenues of making the communities aware that this process is out there and exactly how that's going to impact them. Because I think we all know the problem we have with our world today is that you know our attention span is short. So if you are not really aware until it's like sitting up in your face. So until you really know what that impact is going to be, you tend to let other people handle it. So you need to really get involved with the process, know when things are going to happen, how that's going to impact you. I mean, if you can understand those things, then I think it can be a good vehicle to get these plans implemented, you know, the long-term use plans. I think that could work, but it still has a, a ways to go. It sounds good on paper, or it looks good on paper, but to actually get people involved is, can be very difficult. I'm sure you all know. So. Are there other questions uh, that anyone from the audience would like to ask the panel? Um, yes, ma'am. This isn't a, a question, but uh, Daryl, you were talking about looking into the campaign contributions for candidates. Mm -hmm. I'm from Denton, um, and up in Denton, we have a guy who's been in the political office for quite a while. His name is Chris Watts. He was on city council for, I believe, eight years, then mayor for six, and he's running for city council again. He's also a landlord. Most of his friends are landlords or developers or that type. Um, and so a, a complimentary tactic that I found was that you can just drive around and look who has the big Chris Watts or whatever candidate yard signs up, and then you can go into DCAD and you can figure out who owns that property. In about two hours of driving around, I found 20 signs for Chris Watts. Of those, I believe 16 or 17 were on the homes or properties of landlords, developers, realtors, or people working in that industry. And then that's a very good visual, and then if you want to throw in the campaign contributions behind that, I found uh, one couple who, according to the internet, was one of the worst landlords in Denton. And now I'm kind of wishing I had uh, put that sign with the graphic that was like, and here's how much they contributed to Chris Watts as well. So I think that may be a tactic for anyone in the room to look into. You're making me sound not so crazy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyone else care to comment? Is there a... <laughs> Another question, anyone from the audience? Don't be shy. Well, I would um, like to just say a word about uh, coalition building. We kind of passed over that, or I did in my opening remarks. Uh, this is a very difficult process. What you, what you see are dedicated volunteers. Very, very few paid staff in this business. And it took a lot of work to bring more than 20 organizations from across the city to coalesce around a few common issues. So I would just like to emphasize that and pay some tribute to the volunteers across the city who've been involved in not just this coalition, but other nonprofit environmental justice organizations. Uh, secondly, if there aren't any other questions, um, I would like to thank and for you to acknowledge maybe with uh, some clapping are the panelists and, and the job that they've done. <laughs> and thank you all for coming and attending. Uh, we do appreciate it. 
I wish I could say that there would be cookies and ice cream somewhere out here, but I can't. Thank you very much.